morning. Once again, welcome to Whispering Hope Daily Sabbath School Lesson Study. Today is the day when we may just have two hosts. And let's hope that that happens, that the real host for the day comes and take me out of... But this morning, I'm happy to be with three illustrious elders, Elder Alison Jarvis, Elder Ronald Thomas, and Elder Morris Tyrell. Good morning, gentlemen. How is it? How has been your weekend and how are you looking forward to the week? Good morning. Good morning. I've been morning. blessed. Morning. I've been blessed by God. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. Just want to say I'm alive. God is good. Okay, so this week we are studying Mission to the Unreached Part 1. Mission to the Unreached Part 1. And today's specific topic are Hebrew in Athens, a Hebrew in Athens. But before we d dive into our study this morning, we're going to ask Elder Tyrell to say our prayer for us this morning to invite God's presence into our midst. And then we'll ask Elder Thomas to read our memory text for us today. Good morning, all. A delight to be with you, brethren. Let us bow our heads as we approach the throne of God. Almighty and ever living Father, we give you thanks this morning for waking us up in our right minds. Lord, we thank you for the blessings of the night. How you granted us rest and protected us from the elements. And as you've brought us awake, Lord, this morning, prepare the path ahead of us and give us the wisdom to recognize your leadership and fall without resistance. Dear God, I give you the homes and households of every listener, every neighbor, recognizing, of course, our neighborhood has no walls. And Lord, when you shall put in your appearing, I pray, Lord, you'll find all of us ready and faithful so you may take us with you to your kingdom. We will serve you forever for Christ's sake. Amen. 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 And our memory text this morning comes from Acts chapter 17 and verse 24 in the studies from the NIV. It says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. Mm -hmm. So we're going to look at our memory text this week. Before we go into our study, we always draw out what is in that memory text. This morning, we're going to start with Elder Alson Jarvis first. Elder Alson, as you heard Brother Thomas reading that text or as you went through it in preparation for today, what were the key issues you drew from that point, from that passage that we have as our key text for this week? Well, I see that Paul is here seeking to establish from the beginning that in the beginning was God. And it is through him that everything came and nothing was made that he didn't make and it is about establishing this particular foundation is which is by which we are able to express to individuals that because god is the source of all things he deserves worship he deserves to be honored as god we can't expect that god is going to come out of some amoeba that you know came from some germ that crawled out of the sea and turned to some creature and became a monkey and then he evolved into man if that's the case then nothing is worthy we can choose whom we serve but here paul established that god created all things and because and he is not something that we create I remember that the, uh, the, the prophet Isaiah spoke about those that go out and carve a god out of wood, make it, of, polish it, and carve it nicely, and set it on a mantle, and then call it God. It's of no, God is of no such. He is our creator, he is our sustainer, and he is our savior. The opening of this text, the God who made the world and everything in it. Now, this is all inclusive. God made this world and everything. And what is very interesting is a point that we all need to take into consideration. If you look at the order of creation, he created everything that man would ever needed and then he created man last. Tells me then God didn't need help. And so no man should be making a claim of ownership. 
20 things that God has created. And then he goes on to say, and does not live in temples built by human hands. You know, God doesn't live in any, in any enclosure. He's ever present. As the term he uses, he's omnipresent. So he's present everywhere at the same time. And we need to recognize the fact that God did not give title or ownership to anything that, is, that he created to man. If a man owns nothing, we possess and we have the, the responsibility to manage and to take care of. And so we must recognize and respect the fact that God made us worthy of taking care of his creation. And also as we look at the backdrop to, to the statement, we recognize that Paul was looking at the Athenians and the fact that they had so many temples and so many images of so many different gods in an attempt to, to highlight, as it were, you know, the gods who they worship. And, and because of these images and so forth, they would have, um, you know, made a life for themselves in giving honor to these gods. And, and Paul was just basically stating that the God that really created everything is bigger than this. You can't put him in a temple. So um, all the gods that you really have here are really nothing because the one who made everything, um, you can make something to put him in so that you can worship him. So he was just highlighting that the God that you would come to him is really the true and living God who really created everything. All right, so we're going to go right into our text that we have to begin our discussion this morning. Acts chapter 17, verses 1 to 16. Acts chapter 17, 1 to 16. We'll ask Elder Jarvis to read verses 1 to 5. Elder Thomas, verses 6 to 10. And Elder Tyrell will read the rest and then we'll come right back to our question. Acts 17, reading from the King James Version from verse 1, it says, Now when they had passed through Amphilopis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, and as his manner was, went unto them the three Sabbath days, reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have been suffered and risen again from the dead, and that his death, Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude and of the chief women, not a few. But the Jews, who believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain low, lewd fellows of the base assault, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason had received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and others, they let them go. And the Brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who, coming thither, went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul, go as it were to the sea. But Silas and, and Timotheus abode there still. And they had conducted Paul 
brought him unto Athens, and receiving the commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Amen, amen. So a question here, it says, how did Paul wind up in Athens and how did he respond to what he found there? That question, we're going to give that to, to Elder Jarvis, Elder Thomas. Elder Jarvis and Elder Thomas. How did Paul wind up in Athens and how did he respond to what he found there? We can say Paul was on the run so to speak, because there he was in Thessalonica. And if you look at what happened, the Jews here decided that they don't believe in this Jesus. And they sought to rile up, as we would say, the people. And the Bible speaks about the base people, the degenerates of society, and sought to get them by declaring that here they are the, they are saying that there is another king and he's not caesar and they paul and silas took flight and went to berea where he indicated that they were more noble than the thessalonicas and the people from thessalonica came when they heard they were in berea to stir up trouble there too so paul had to run again so he was on the run and he came to Athens where the philosophers were. And here I believe that he took the opportunity to bring the true God in. As we know that as scripture goes, where God's people go, God, God, God is present and he needs to be introduced to the people there. And he, Paul, sought a skillful manner by identifying that they had an uh, unknown God and use that as the pretext to introduce the true God as the unknown one and reveal who he is to the people in Athens. But Paul was really on the run for his life from the other cities. When we consider what happened with the gospel, even after Christ went back to heaven, was persecution that spread the gospel. It became the fire behind the disciples, moving from one place to the other. And we saw the same thing happening here to Paul. So the mission was for one thing, and there were some who believed that they would have stopped God's work. And even today, the enemy always tried some way to stop God's work. But that, I mean, a disappointment in God's work becomes divine appointment. And so God divinely sent Paul to Athens, and the gospel was spread there. So enemy today always try different ways to stop the work of God, but God's work will go on because it's his work and it will be done whether we want to be a part of it or not, or who want to stop it or not. God's work will continue until the end. Amen, amen. So our question, our next question for Elder Tyrell and Elder Jarvis, what would be our Athens in these modern times also what should be our response so what would be our athens in these modern times and what should be our response interestingly enough for athens is as varied as their people and uh, my unique athens is some neighbors in my neighborhood who I keep constantly in prayer but I'm still waiting on God to change some attitudes. Nonetheless, with God, everything is possible. And as we, as we are told, if we are to be successful, quitting is never an option. He quit his own win and winners don't quit. So, I have some difficulties with some neighbors around for a variety of reasons. Some, I'm not aware of any of them. It's just 
it, it, it's, it's justified, but I live every day through the blessings of God and ask him to continue to hold my hand and take me through the difficulties of life. And so my response is it's one of total dependence and cooperation with God. Because with him, all things are possible. And we must accept the fact that as we, as we surrender to him and cooperate and follow his leadings, in the end, we will be victorious. We are going to meet individuals in every walk of life where they will express to you, well, I am not a believer in Christ. I have a different philosophy. I have a different understanding. And I don't think that this Jesus thing is makes sense. You know, one of the very popular comments that are made is as a, among us as black people is that this is a white man's creation to keep us enslaved. You know, so we really do come to the whole issue of various persons having various beliefs. And, it, you know, it goes back to the to Daniel, where the image was set up and down in his feet were the iron and clay. But interestingly enough, Daniel indicated when the stone that represents God's kingdom, he ground the image and the dust, the gold and the silver and the brass and the clay, all of it blew away, you know. In the end of time, down in the feet of iron and clay, you're going to find the gold and the silver. And we know that those represent, at least the silver represents the philosophies of Greece, where there are various gods, there are a, a plethora of gods, and persons think in that their concepts and ideas stand higher and taller than the word of God. And, you know, we are at that time where persons are really gods to themselves and it's about i and i and what i think what i believe what i know what i accept what i trust it's just a lot of eyes and where we find these individuals we have to be able to be one mindful that the work of transformation is the spirit's work what we are to do is to seek to introduce people if they're not into interested in the introduction we need to seek to show them something different by how we live and indicating who jesus is through our actions how we respond to them how we deal with them if we have to deal with them on a daily basis show them something different that the spirit will work his work of transformation and create an opportunity for persons to see and accept and even be interested in something different. They all may not come because God does not overrule a man's personal choice. As long as we have opportunity to hear and make a decision, that's really what God is interested in. He said that we need to be willing and we need to be obedient and as long as that is the case, he'll be able to do a work. But if we're not, then that is still our choice that we need to make. Amen, amen. So our final question for this morning. What kind of idols are people worshipping in your society? And how can you open their eyes to how worthless it all is? Now, this is for everyone everyone's experience is different so we'll begin with elder thomas then elder jarvis and then we'll end with elder Turil. what kinds of idols are people worshiping in your society and how can you open their eyes to how worthless it all is i think today there are so many idols uh, far more than what was in athens just to make a statement on the question before I think Athens could also be like a state of mind. Some people dwell on, some people are very superstitious today, and some people dwell on philosophy, and that's where they are. The idols today is, is I think, one of the biggest idols we have is entertainment. And the, in, in the entertainment industry, you have music, 
some people are just about music you have movies and you have sports and i think those are three of the biggest idols that <laughs> you might find around one of the things that i recognize melinda jarvis spoke about it earlier is that paul as, as he looked at what was happening as he observed athens he recognized and even though he was troubled by the fact that the i mean athens seemed to be a idol worshiping city he looked for something that he could use to grab the attention of the people something that they that they could they could identify with and and so as he looked through that he saw that while they had all these gods there was an unknown one and and he used that to begin to present the christ you know in in some time back i remember i used to like to watch a lot of movies and in a lot of them i would sometimes find a one line a sentence that somebody said that i could use to introduce some part of the gospel because what was said was true um, and so we, we can go into sometimes people wonder why you want to listen to this song or why you want to but but you could find something there to grab the attention of the person who is hooked on that pointing them to the real musician or the real music you know that that really makes sense and and, and so i always remember this, this movie the matrix the first one uh, tell about the others but the first one <laughs> and to me it was i saw in the a state of being born again you know and the tremendous power that one have when they're born again so that you could just pray and whatever weapons you need you, you know whatever ability you need to pr to perform your task you know um it is done and then you have a you have a armor a spiritual armor that bullets can't pierce you know these kind of things and, and, and you're able to move in ways that the uh, bible says that the spirit move wait 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 moves and no, you don't know and so all these things i see come out of stuff like that so i think as we look at the idols that people have today it's a good thing as we go to minister wherever we go to minister that we first become observant of what people are attached to what they're doing what they're interested in and use find a wedge there to be able to present the gospel but there are so many idols today that we it, it's just all over but the gospel is still like you know I, elder said it is the kingdom of god that will be established and destroy all the other gods and all the other kingdoms and we just have to as we work as we talk about mission we just have to know the wisdom of god allow the holy spirit to direct us and appoint us our duty so that we can just spread the word wherever we are what kind of gods are there well i think really the prophet of the lord indicated that at the end of or end of time spiritualism would be really right and right in our in our societies and the one of the greatest manifestation of spiritualism is what came down to us from the french revolution where reason my own thoughts my own ideas are elevated above the word of god and god has to subject himself to what i think and i can redirect re readjust uh, translate his word as i see fit and he has to accept what i do to it even to the place where we don't believe him at all so self i believe is the greatest idol that we find in our generation where i can declare that i am no longer who i am i want to be something else and everyone has to accept what i say and treat me how i want to be treated because my my thing is mine and mine alone and i have all rights and everyone need to accept my rights and i and i and i and the i and i is not even the rastafarians you know we we really have to come to the place where we need to subject ourselves under the mighty hand of god 
understand that he is greater accept that he is king of kings and lord of lords and it is only his salvation will save it's only his way and there's no other way there's no name on the heaven given among men whereby we might be saved but the mighty name of jesus so when we come to that place we're able to humble ourselves and realize that we need Jesus in everything. So we have to put aside the personal gods, the personal ideas, and accept what God has given to us in the book that is given for what is necessary before we can leave this earth. In my locality, in my, my society actually, what I find is a tremendous amount of competitive egotism. And many folks in my, in my neighborhood tend to cherish material things. We look at the cars we drive, the houses in which we live, forgetting, of course, that all these are temporary things there's a good possibility that we may or may, well, we may or may not outlast these things, but they have no spiritual benefit. The same way a, a Mercedes could, can take you to a distance, my contention, a Volkswagen can take you the same distance. So why do we spend large sums of money to accomplish the same thing that less expenditure can accomplish. And by so doing, this is the tendency to, to compare ourselves with each other. I have a bigger one than you. Mine is newer than yours. Mine costs more money than yours. Forgetting, of course, that whatever we possess is a blessing from God. And instead of thanking God for the blessings, we, we tend to be egotistical. And uh, if I should use a new term, we said we tend to be Nebuchadnezzarists. And we, <laughs> we pound our chest <laughs> and advertise, look what I have. Look what I and the Elder Javis says, egotism sets in. And so that is one of the, the biggest challenges I have in my neighborhood. And I'd like to remind all my, my neighbors and my, my local society that the only thing that we can take out of this world is a clean character. None of the material things we possess. We didn't bring them into this world and we can't take them away. Yesterday I attended a funeral of a close friend and he's gone. He's gone to the grave, taking nothing with him. So we need to focus on the here and the, the life hereafter and the benefits that Christ promises us when he comes to claim his own. That would be my advice to my friends and neighbors. Amen, amen. amen. So you know that when we come to the end of our discussion, in recent times, I've only been asking for one sentence. So we are here again at our takeaway and Many points have been brought out in our lesson, but you can only choose one. So we'll begin in the same order, Elder Jarvis, Elder Thomas, and then Elder Tyrell, and then we'll wrap up. My takeaway really is we're going to have difficulties sometimes preaching Christ. Most Many persons will not accept, but we need to ask the Holy Spirit to lead and open doors, create opportunities where hearts and minds can come to a place where they know Jesus for themselves. My takeaway is, is it doesn't matter how difficult the situation is, the people are, the community, wherever we might go, um, God is able to work through us to bring the message of salvation. I am a tickler for stewardship. 
And so this lesson reminds us of whatever we, we, we possess. And notice they possess. I didn't say own, so we own nothing. Like in, in the last question that you ask, we look around and we see that there's a tendency to worship things. But we must, we, we must be reminded that we can only successfully worship Jesus Christ and not the created thing. We must, we must honor the creator and not the created. Amen, amen. So that has brought us to the end of our lesson. We're glad that you could have joined us and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning when our topic will be Paul in the Areopagus. Mm. Paul in the Areopagus. So, interesting word. you learn tomorrow what really that is and what that lesson holds for us. So share the link with the family, share the link with a friend and join us as we continue to study together.